All right, welcome everyone. This is my video for 16.5. Actually, this will cover multiple topics, but the last one that we really need is from 16.5. Uh, this is an exam from fall 2017. So right now when I'm recording it, that's the, uh, the previous semester here. It's the multiple choice question and it's more challenging, right? So it's a good, uh, I'm gonna make a video and we're gonna talk through it a little bit. So this is question number 15. And it says that we have little f is a nice differentiable function with x and y having continuous second order partial derivatives. So kind of all of the niceties are there. Uh, we have a vector field f, which is the gradient of this little f, right? This nice differentiable function. And maybe it has components m and n. That's a little bit different. Usually we use p's and q's, but fine, m and n. Okay. This is the gradient field. C is a nice positively oriented ellipse. There it is, how nice, shown in the sketch below, considering the following statements, and we wanna know, it looks like, which of them are true, which of them are not. So we're gonna go down this and take them one at a time. So part A, right? F is a conservative vector field. So we really have to go back and remember, okay, what did it take for a vector field to be conservative? And the main condition, right, what we really need is that it has a potential function, right? We need a potential function. So the question is, does this f right here have a potential function? And the answer is absolutely, right? It's this little f, right? This right here is saying that little f is the potential function for our vector field. Okay, so yes, this one is absolutely true. All right, that one wasn't so bad. Let's see what the second one looks like. So the second one, remember this uh, symbol right here means that we're doing the line integral over a nice closed, positively oriented curve. In fact, we have C, yes, this is a closed and positively oriented curve. So this is just doubling up on the same information. And again, we have M plus N right, it are the components of our vector field. This is the thing that we're integrating over. And the question is, is that line integral equal to zero? Okay, well, for me, what I'm thinking about, since we have a conservative vector field, since this came first, right, I know that for a conservative vector field, this is gonna satisfy, you know, the fundamental theorem of line integrals, so long as everything's relatively nice, right? So this is gonna be kind of like an F of B, minus an f of a sort of situation, right? Especially because we have this nice potential function. So if you start and end, right, we have a nice closed curve. So maybe you start and end at the same point. Well, whatever the function's value is at that point, and then you subtract it from itself, right? This is saying that a and b are the same point. You start and end at the same point. So if this one's five and you subtract away five, you get out zero or whatever, if it's seven, you subtract away seven, or if it's negative 100 and you subtract away negative 100, in all cases, you seem to get out zero. The only caveat to this, the only condition that we really need in order to apply this fundamental theorem of line integrals beyond having you know a potential function is that we need our vector field to be nice. It should have continuous uh, uh, partial derivatives. It should satisfy Clairaut's theorem, all this good stuff. Uh, so the question is, is our vector function, is this nice? Right, and so we go back here and we actually see, right, we have continuous second order partial derivatives. And this is the big thing right here uh, because, right, these are gonna be f sub x and f sub y. So if you take the derivatives of these, right, they're gonna be nice and continuous. So yes, this should be equal to zero. We have everything that we need in order to say that this one is going to be zero. So a, and B, I believe, are both correct. Notice too that they were a little bit nice in this case, even if you forgot about, you know, that caveat about having continuous second order partial derivatives sort of deal, you would still get the correct answer. So long as you were thinking about the fundamental theorem of line integrals and the fact that you start and end at the same spot, right? You're over a loop or a closed curve, right? You would get out zero. And so yes, you would get the same answer, even if you forgot that there was this extra caveat uh, sort of deal to applying the fundamental theorem of line integrals. Okay. This final condition, C here, is where we really need 16.5, and that's why I had to wait until this video in order to do it, right? Because in 16.5, we bring up this notion of curl, curl and divergence. And so in this case, we're not using full curl, but we're using curl dot K. So remember the curl, the curl is talking about circulation. You have a lot of circulation and you have different components to the circulation. 
So the full curl vector looks something like this, right? So in the first component, you're going to have kind of the YZ plane circulation. I'm just going to denote it with circ. In the second component, you have the XZ plane circulation. Again, I'll denote it with circ. And then finally, in the final component, you're going to have the XY plane circulation. Again, denoting it with circ. And the way that you remember this is, right, first of all is the X component, second is the Y component, third is the Z component, right? And so X is the thing that's missing, YZ. Y is the thing that's missing, XZ. Z is the thing that's missing, XY. So if you were to go ahead and dot product this along with the vector K, Remember, K looks like, and I'm going to have to snake around here a little bit, K is 0, 0, 1. It's the standard unit vector here, uh, 0, 0, 1. So when you dot product that those together, right, you're going to have 0 times the XZ plane circulation, which is good because, right, this is the XY plane. We just have Xs and Ys here. Likewise, zero dot the XZ plane circulation. Again, there are no Zs. What's this Z thing? There are only Xs and Ys. And so finally, when you take the dot product with K, right, you just get right, the XY plane circulation. I'll write it out this time. And again, remember, you get one times this. And then you'd have zero times who cares plus zero times who cares. That's how you take the dot product, right? So zero, zero, one. So, okay. Again, the, the final result, what we get, what is this curl dot K? This is just the XY plane circulation. And the claim is this is a very important component. Uh, we'll see things like this, especially as we continue on into Stokes theorem. Uh, so that's going to be 16.8. This becomes, you know, looking at it in this, these terms, you know, becomes uh, popular. This is what we'll do. All right, so again, we've just simplified down this left-hand side, and we now know that all of this over here, this just means the XY plane circulation. And the question is, is that greater than zero? Is that greater than zero? And now this one is starting to get you know, me pretty suspicious because it has not specified a point, right? Usually we'd ask about the circulation at a point, this one right here is just saying, is it always greater than zero, right? Because it hasn't specified a point to us. And whenever you say, is it always greater than zero, the likelihood of that is probably not. Let's go ahead and review, though. Positive circulation, meaning that we have a positive orientation, means that we're looking for stuff going around in the counterclockwise direction. Right, that stuff's getting pushed in this counterclockwise direction. There's more pushing in the counterclockwise direction than there is pushing in the clockwise direction. Right? Clockwise would be a negative orientation. The circulation would be negative. So we're really looking for, is stuff getting pushed around in the counterclockwise direction? And not just at one point, but at all points. And the claim is this is possible. It would be possible to actually do this. So, I mean, maybe you have, uh, and I don't know exactly what it is right here, you know, off the top of my head, but maybe you have, you know, kind of a spin field sort of deal where it's kind of everything is getting spun around in a counterclockwise direction. And maybe, right, this could actually happen. So something like this, the curl is always positive. So it is possible, it's just not very likely maybe. So this right here would be a spin field where everything is, where the curl dot K, right, the circulation in the XY plane is always positive. It is possible, but let's see if it happens in this case. And so the claim is there are lots of places that you can look on this and see that it doesn't work out. Uh, one place in particular, so I'm just going to focus up here, maybe around the point 1, 1, or I don't really know what this point is here. But we can see at this point that the vector down here is trying to push this circulation around in the counterclockwise direction, right? It's helping kind of rev this up so it's go, you know, circulating around in this uh, counterclockwise direction. So this is kind of helping the circulation be positive. Oops, I accidentally erased my point as well. Didn't mean to do that. There we go. 
but actually the vector right above it is hurting, right? So this vector right here is trying to push it, you know, it's revving it in this direction, right? It's going in the clockwise direction. And so if we just look at those two and we wonder, okay, which of those two vectors is stronger, right? Usually this has to do with the magnitude, the magnitude or the length of the vector. In this diagram here, it looks like the length all seems to be relatively the same. They're uh, denoting bigger, stronger vectors. Vectors with more magnitude is thicker, right? You can see that there are thick vectors and there are thin vectors sort of deal. So this one up here, the one on top is stronger, right? It does have more magnitude. So at this point right here, we would be going in this clockwise direction, not counterclockwise. Right? And again, we want to know when is the circulation going in the counterclockwise direction? Is this always true? And the answer is no. It is certainly not always true. And that confirms our suspicion, right? Uh, I thought this was kind of a tall order to always have this be positive. And so even without the equation of the vector field given to us, just by looking at it and interpreting the picture, we know that C has to be false. And therefore, the answer in this case, well, A is true and B is true. So it looks like down here, the selection that we should make is B, that only A and B are true. All right, so yes, this was a certainly a more challenging multiple choice problem. That's why I wanted to do a video on this. Quite often, I mean, if you have problems where you just have to calculate out curl or if you have to calculate out divergence, those aren't so bad. But I think now, uh, you know, especially since we have these challenging page problems sort of deal, I think they didn't have it at the time of this exam. I believe that this problem right here deserves to really be on one of, you know, one of these challenging questions. Even though it's a multiple choice, I, I think that this would make a fine challenging question because you really do have to understand the concepts of this. You know, it's a couple layers deep uh, for sure. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope you got something out of it. I'll see you guys next time. We'll be talking about surface area. See you then.